And, and, and if you believe in God, and if you're a follower of God, one of your deepest desires and prayers is that he would set you free from that. And the passage of Scripture we're about to read, the Israelites at that time, they saw these verses as verses of great hope because they believed that, that these verses described a person who would come, who would be a liberator, who would set them free from the kind of bondage that they were experiencing at that time under the Roman Empire. So uh, we're about to read them now. Uh, we'll begin at verse 1, chapter 61. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. When the Israelites read these verses, they said, you know what? These verses talk about somebody who's going to come, who's going to do this for us, who's going to set captives free. They, they saw themselves as captives who need to be set free, who are going to proclaim uh, freedom for those who are in prison. They, they were looking for someone who would bring the day of vengeance upon their enemies, who would comfort those who are mourning. They saw themselves as ones who were in mourning, and they needed to be comforted. To provide for those who grieve. They saw themselves as in grief because they're under the thumb of foreign oppressors. Uh, they, they saw themselves as, as their nation being in ashes and God would bestow on them a crown of beauty. And they saw themselves in mourning and God would give to them the oil of gladness. You see how this works? I said, man, one of these days, someone is coming who is going to do what David did. Set us free from our enemies. And these are the blessings that God is going to give to us. All right, back to Luke chapter 4. So, you've got to see the drama of it all. Jesus is out. He's preaching. There's a buzz about him. People are asking, who is this guy? He's teaching in a way that people haven't heard before. People are, 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 wow, you've got to see this guy. You've got to listen to him. He's up to something. And he comes to his hometown. He goes into the synagogue. He comes up to the front. He has the Isaiah scroll handed to him. He opens up to chapter 61. And this is what happens. Uh, verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then, as if describing every action that's happening, then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And remember, at that time, you would actually sit down as you taught or preached. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Okay, he's just read this scripture passage. What is he going to say? What is going to happen next? He's back home, and he says these words. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And the Bible says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? So, so you can picture it, right? I mean, he's been out everywhere else, and now he comes in, and he preaches a sermon. He says, you know these words right here? Today, this scripture passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. That is me. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. This is what I'm for. That is me. And it says everybody is speaking well of him. They're, they're praising him. The, and, and this is what they're saying. They're saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't, isn't he a hometown boy? Isn't this great? I mean, one of ours it, it, is this. Now, uh, very interesting what happens next. Sometimes uh, people have certain expectations and... You ever have this where people have expectations of you and you feel just almost compelled to like fit into their mold? Uh, what happens here just, it blows apart that kind of idea. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Now every culture has its own proverbs or wise statements and we're probably not familiar with this one. Physician, 
heal yourself. So let me see if I can try and explain what it meant in its own culture. Um, the idea was this. If, if you're a doctor, if you're someone who heals someone, that if your son or daughter or someone close to you is sick, you would certainly heal them first before going out somewhere else. And so the idea is sort of like take care of your own. That would be like a statement we have in English. Take care of your own. That's, you concentrate on your own people first and then branch out. And he's now in his own hometown. And people are like, isn't this Joseph's son? And they're excited because, and it may be difficult for us to understand this, they lived in this communal culture. And the idea was, was when one person got ahead or stood out, it was as though the whole group of people were pulled up with him, and they're excited because they think, man, we're a part of this now. He's from us, and he'll certainly do something here before going other places. In fact, Jesus, the next thing he says, if you look at this passage of Scripture, he says, surely you're going you're gonna to quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. So they're hearing about the miracles that Jesus is doing, and they're like, great, he's one of ours. He's certainly going to do more here then he's done other places. Do you see kind of the, how this is working? In fact, and again, I don't know if this will totally make sense. It may make sense in my mind because I lived it. And if it doesn't make sense to you, well, there it is. Uh, while we were living in Nigeria, also a very communal culture, uh, it so happened that a man from the village that we were living in became the president of the entire denomination that we were serving. So he rose to the top. And then uh, I remember when he came back home and he gave a speech, there was the same kind of buzz like, all right, one of ours has become super important and he's now come back. And he used an African proverb, which again, I don't know if this will make sense to you, but I'll try my best to explain it. He said this, he said, listen, everybody, let me tell you something. When mama's in the kitchen, the children don't go hungry. That was the African proverb and it meant, I mean, people started applauding as soon as they heard that because it meant this. Now that one of yours is at the top, you're going to receive all the blessings. You see how that works? And that's the expectation here in, in, in Jesus' hometown as well. All right, if Jesus is the one, if he's doing these miracles other places, if this scripture passage is now fulfilled and he's the one, we are the ones who are going to reap the benefit. And so you can almost see them like taking their fingers and like wrapping them around Jesus. And Jesus' response is like, listen, surely you're going to say, physician, heal yourself, take care of your own, do hear what you've done in other places. But he says, that's not what I'm about. And he actually goes on to talk about two different prophets who, because they had this vision from God, they didn't take care of their own. They had this bigger thing that they were a part of. One of them was Elijah and one of them, Elisha. And we'll just read here, verse 24, what Jesus said. He said, I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So he basically takes one of his prophets and says, listen, Back in history, when Elijah was a prophet and it didn't rain for three and a half years, Jesus said there were plenty of widows who were living in Israel. But because he was a prophet, his vision was so much bigger than just his own people. And God actually sent him to someone who lived in Sidon. And then he has another example from history, the prophet Elisha. He says, and verse 27, there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Again, same idea, right? Elisha was a prophet. And during his ministry, there were a lot of people who had leprosy in Israel. But because God's vision is bigger than just his own, your own people, he actually sent him to a man named Naaman, who the Bible says was a Syrian. 